Hi everybody, welcome back to Principles in Curriculum Design. My name's Alex Ford and I'm a Schools History Project Fellow and PGC Tutor at Leeds Trinity University. Uh, as ever, this session will involve a range of issues around curriculum uh, and you will find links to all the materials that I'm referencing uh, in the uh, description below this video. Okay, so up to this point, we've thought about why we're talking about curriculum and we've looked at two big models of curriculum uh, thinking and kind of two extremes of curriculum thinking, the traditional model of curriculum and the progressive model. And we've thought about how those two address some of those uh, Tyler curriculum questions about, you know, what, what our aims are, how we're going to organise our, ourselves and how we're going to assess and so on. Um, this session, I want to move on to thinking about uh, reconciling and finding uh, not a middle way, but a third way. So a different way of thinking about curriculum altogether. So a third way in curriculum thinking, this is about finding something that is not already out there in different models of curriculum thinking that we've touched on, but is absolutely out there in the way that lots of subject communities uh, have thought about their, their teaching of their subjects over time. So there is a model for this uh, in existence. It's just it's not commonly a model that's at the heart of many school systems. And there's a whole range of reasons for that, not least because of the way school leadership has operated over time, but equally the way the inspectorate has operated over time. Um, and what that's prioritised has been things that sit outside of subject level um, questions and, and sit more at school level and, of course, accountability level in the case of um, uh, the inspectorate. So the beginning, I think, of uh, finding a third way is with this idea that we are aiming to do something which reframes knowledge in terms of the principles we hold for education. And going back again to Tyler's curriculum questions about what our aims are being the starting point, I think this is so, so crucial. So I'm calling this a principle of reframing of knowledge. And I want to introduce you at this point in a little bit more depth to the work of uh, people like Michael Young. So Michael Young, uh, in collaboration with various other people over the last few decades, has written extensively about education and the role of education and actually more recently, the, the specific role of knowledge in education. Uh, and in his 2014 work, Knowledge in the Future School, he talks an awful lot about where knowledge sits in terms of education in his view, in terms of curriculum and curriculum thinking in his view. And I think this is really interesting because he starts it from a number of premises and it's based on his experience actually of having been a great advocate of very progressive curriculum models uh, in doing his own work uh, when in, in post-apartheid South Africa. And one of his reflections on that work was that by stripping out knowledge from the curriculum because it was an exercise in power, he, he felt that the uh, most disadvantaged especially black pupils got cheated of access to the structures which would then allow them to make future change in the country. So I suppose his argument was that knowledge, yes, is an exercise in power, but actually if you take away that knowledge from people um, by taking it out of the curriculum altogether, then you don't necessarily empower them by doing that. Uh, so what are his two really key arguments for me? Number one, he argues that knowledge can be transformational as well as conservative. So although knowledge can be a conservative uh, force and hold people in place, it can also ha have the power to liberate and change us. And I'm gonna come back to that idea later in this session. Secondly, he argues that schools need to focus on what they can contribute uniquely. And part of this argument is that children can learn to do all sorts of things that we put in a generic progressive curriculum elsewhere. Uh, now, I don't think that's always true. It depends on if you have access to these things. But his argument is that uh, if we don't give students access to things that schools can uniquely contribute, we disadvantage them by doing that. So the two quotes to the right, I think, are quite instructive. Uh, and I apologise because they're partly obs obscured. Um, but he talks about providing students with knowledge that takes them beyond their experience. Um, uh, that is knowledge they don't already have access to at home uh, and in the communities in which they live. And he argues that is a right of all pupils. So he says we've got to think really carefully about the knowledge that students won't have access to, which is uh, gives them uh, a liberating, uh, transformative power. And he argues that that's a duty of schools to do that, because if we don't do it, who else will? Uh, and his, his illustration at this point is uh, lots of schools have moved towards progressive curricula in the last 
20 years in order to give students more opportunities, arguably. But he says nobody uh, in the rich and powerful classes or almost nobody in the rich and powerful classes has gone down that route. He says it's really notable, isn't it, that grammar schools uh, and public schools have held on to their very traditional knowledge transfer curricula because they know that there is a power in knowledge and they know there's a particular power in the system in which that um, education operates. So that, again, I, I referenced this in a previous um, uh, session, but that idea that people who've gone to uh, the best school, the best in inverted commas, but the most prestigious schools and universities will come out with a body of knowledge which allows them to have those uh, conversations with other people who have that knowledge and it gives them uh, an into a social network of people as well as everything else. So his argument is if that's going to happen we may as well furnish these students with that knowledge. So he says knowledge is important and schools have a role in providing that knowledge not just replicating what students could or should be able to get at home anyway. So let's think about uh, what reframing is required here. So if we look back at our three models of curriculum if we look at the traditional curriculum, the progressive curriculum and the instrumentalist curriculum. In the traditional curriculum, knowledge is seen as vital because it's a cultural inheritance. It, is, it gives people power in a system that values this knowledge and it's inherently a conservative type of knowledge. It's about conserving that power and it's about preserving that power. And it's about giving those few that can retain that knowledge and use that knowledge appropriately access to those systems as well. The progressive curriculum basically argues that all knowledge is an exercise in power and therefore we may as well get rid of knowledge to a certain degree and actually at the very extremes completely get rid of that knowledge and replace it with transferable skills and we liberate the curriculum therefore from oppression um, and give people uh, and reframe our whole way of thinking for a different future. And the instrumentalist of course just said whatever works we don't care. The reframing comes similar to Young, so knowledge can have a power for good and ill. So the progressives say it's, it's for ill, the traditionalists say it's a good thing. Um, that sounds like something from um, 1066 and all that. So knowledge can have a power for both. It depends what you do with it. And so what Jung's approach is, and what I would argue I would agree with him on, on this front, is that we therefore need to recognise that and harness the power of that knowledge to support our own educational aims and principles. And for young, there's a very deep social justice theme that is much more in kin with uh, progressive curriculum thinking in, in what he's doing. And he's saying, I, I want to harness the power of uh, knowledge in order to give students access to those aspects of social justice that I want to see. And for us, I think in terms of finding a third way, we need to start with our aims and think about how we can and could and should maybe harness knowledge in order to further those particular aims that we have. And then it brings the question of well, what kinds of knowledge, and we'll get onto that a little bit later on. Now, I want to illustrate this point about knowledge having power a little bit more because uh, I think it's really interesting to see the role that knowledge plays in education. And a lovely way of doing this, and there's all sorts of ways I could do this, but I really like this. Um, I've included with this session some extracts, and you'll find the link down below, some extracts from the book Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain. And in this book, if you don't, if you haven't come across the writings of Twain, uh, he, he's absolutely brilliant. It's, a, it's kind of a bit like a 19th century Bill Bryson, which may endear you or put you off his books. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I love it. I think it's really, really interesting. Uh, he's a very astute political commentator. But as well as writing a whole range of works about 19th century America and some very funny things, um, he also wrote this, which is uh, an autobiography, really, looking at his early life and how he became an author. And ultimately, Mark Twain starts out his life as uh, in terms of his career on a riverboat. And he starts out his life uh, as a steersman on a riverboat, a riverboat pilot eventually. Uh, and most of the book is dedicated to that process of him first joining a riverboat, persuading somebody to take him on uh, and learning under a man called Mr. Bixby, who is the captain of the boat. Uh, and in his book, he talks about it in a lot of depth. And Mark Twain, interestingly, was, was, was actually quite an educationist. He had a lot of ideas about how you should teach children and taught his own children some very weird and wonderful ways about history, actually. Um, he uh, learns how to become a riverboat pilot under the stewardship of Mr. Bixby. And what's really interesting is to look at the way in which he learns and how he learns over time to become more independent and ultimately becomes a pilot 
by the end. Uh, now you can, if you want, you can go and read the book and I would really recommend that. However, if you want to just look at the extracts that I've included here, you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, so first of all, there are, I think, four extracts I've included. What kind of knowledge is Mark Twain developing at each of these stages? So it begins in his very early stages of learning to be a riverboat pilot and ends near the end of his um, training and before he becomes a fully fledged pilot. Um, how does the knowledge he learns in, underpin and enable him to learn other things further down the line? And how does Mr. Bixby make sure that that knowledge is embedded and how does that change over time as well so i think some really interesting things to look for i hope you enjoy this exercise because I, I think it's a really lovely book anyway um, and i hope it, it encourages at least one person to go and read a little bit of mark twain uh, and take that a little bit deeper but look at the power that knowledge has by looking at the way mark twain describes his own education becoming a riverboat pilot um, in the 19th century Right, so I just want to spend a little bit of time unpicking uh, what we saw in that Mark Twain extract um, from Life on the Mississippi. And I think what's really interesting here is we see a whole range of things happening in terms of what Twain has to learn and in what sort of order. Uh, and also we get a sense of the kinds of methods that his teacher, in this case, Mr. Bixby, um, who in many cases is a kind of reluctant teacher, but then gets into it, uh, how he uses those. And I think this obviously it's not a direct parallel, but there are some parallels here to what we end up doing in the classroom. So let's have a little think about what we've got here. Um, th the first real thing that I think Twain learns in that first extract, and I'm just looking down at my version here, uh, is that uh, he really needs to know some of the key information by heart. So he ends up learning things like this is six mile point, this is nine mile point. He has to know the names of the key points on the river, uh, which experienced pilots use to divide up that journey and understand that journey. Uh, and initially he kind of has to learn those and he doesn't really understand the relevance of that. And there's that lovely exchange in the middle where he's talking about uh, where Mr. Bixby asks him to give the first name of the, the, the name of the first point above New Orleans. And he says, well, I don't know. Um, and Bixby, of course, is is furious and, and all the rest of it. But um, he gets on, and I think gets on to a really important point that if he wants, if Twain wants to become a pilot, he has to learn these kind of core details um, about the river, the Mississippi River. Um, and he does that really through a very straightforward, very what we might call traditional input recall methodology. Uh, he says, get a memorandum book. Every time I tell you a thing, write it down straight away. Um, and then you'll get the entire river by heart. So there is a core of knowledge here it's about input and checking and and that's what's happening but actually it doesn't stop there and this is really important because this is where the rebirth of the traditional curriculum has kind of stopped in some ways it's just about input recall and now interesting there's some some debate around that and, and people start to say maybe that wasn't enough and i agree i think even if you look back at anything written about education you'll realize that just simple input recall isn't going to be enough so where does it go from there well, the next thing that Twain has to do is realise the importance of all this knowledge. Uh, at the beginning, again, we get, I, I love that bit in here where he talks about um, Bixby finding this plantation in the dark. He doesn't understand that that's uh, Bixby's experience and knowledge all coming together to find that plantation in the dark. What he thinks is this is this is the luckiest accident that ever happened, he calls it, which I think is fantastic. So at this point, he doesn't yet understand the importance of the knowledge. And I think there's a teaching point here, and it's a, a teaching point for Bixby as it is a teaching point for us, that unless we really understand the purpose of the knowledge that we're learning, it, it really is going it, to, it's irrelevant because if we don't understand where it's taking us or what it's doing for us, we are prone, if unless we're desperately interested in it, to discard it as not that relevant to ourselves. Um, and that's the same for students, of course, if they're sitting in a, in a history lesson, a geography lesson, an RE lesson, and they don't understand why they're learning something, for whatever reason that be, and that, you know, we often frame that in terms of you'll need this for the exam, but actually, more interestingly, why will this add value to you? Why is this important? Why is this interesting? Why is this fascinating? Um, if we don't do that, then, then we don't get to know what it is. How does Bixby do that in the end? Well, he does it through practical modelling and demonstration. He demonstrates why it's so important to know these things by showing to him what he could achieve if he did these things. And I think that's true of us for teachers as well. We have to let students in uh, to understand the wonder, the fascination, the interest of our subject, as well as what it can might practically do for them in later life as well. Anyway, so we, we're kind of going on to some key learning. The next really big thing that he ends up learning, or the big things he ends up learning as we move on, and this is into the second extract and slightly into third as well, um, is he really he now needs to know the connecting items so it's not just the individual points of knowledge about the, the specific river bends um, but he has to know 
uh, and obviously the depth at various points and various other things, he needs to know the shape of the river. So it's not just that he needs to know all the disjointed parts, but he needs to know how it feels and how it how it joins up. So that bigger, longer narrative. And that for me is in education when students go beyond just seeing things as isolated little chunks of knowledge and start seeing how they fit into a bigger picture. Um, and how do we do this? Well, in a whole range of things, uh, we obviously have to do it through practice and we have to learn the shape, but we also have to. Uh, predict and think about what's coming next, what might come next in our narrative in history, for example, what might come next in the story. Um, how is this, uh, you know, we've just done this experiment in science, let's kind of predict what might happen if we do this experiment, which is based on that experiment. Uh, and that kind of idea that we have to start thinking about how the story connects up is really important because we are making sense of it ourselves. Uh, and there's, this extract really goes around that idea of uh, Bixby talking about, you know, my boy, you've got to know the shape of the river perfectly so that you can steer on a very dark night. And Twain kind of despairs and he goes, because Bixby's saying, well, it, it changes and it changes in different weather and it changes at different times of the year and it changes at night and it changes in day. And Twain is at, at sea because he's saying that's a lot of knowledge, effectively. That's a lot of individual facts to learn. And Bixby says, no, there's one shape to the river and you have to learn that shape and then it will you will fit the knowledge into that. And that, I think, is the shift that uh, the, the important shift that needs to happen if we want to move students onto a thinking version of education. It's not just about learning a million different bits of knowledge. It's learning the shapes into which those knowledge fit. And then as he masters all this knowledge, the third extract, the reason I've included the third extract, um, we start to see that Bixby is beginning to take him beyond just learning stuff and even learning shapes and even learning that, but into the practical application and independent thinking. And so what does he get Twain to do in this section? Uh, he, he sets him off down a section of the river, which he see, knows quite well. And then he allows him to go further than his confidence. Um, he allows him to steer. He allows him to um, try and work the whole thing himself. And I think this is really important in education, too, that sometimes we have to let students go. We have to let them build their own argument in history and make those claims. And sometimes they will overclaim and you'll need to say, well, hang on and, and steer them back in the right direction. And that's exactly in terms of the methods what Bixby does here. He gives guided independence to Twain to go and apply his knowledge in a context and then allow him to take it beyond that context slightly and be there in the background to save him from inevitable disaster, which is what nearly happens here. And there's also something else interesting in here, uh, which is he's now starting to help Twain uh, take his simple knowledge understanding and challenge it and start to overcome some of the misconceptions he's developed. Uh, so he has this idea that he's seen this reef in the river and he's trying to avoid it. And Bixby says, well, like, that can't be a reef because you know there isn't a reef here and a reef can't suddenly have appeared overnight. So this must be something else. And he talks about this idea of a wind reef, which is when the wind, uh, I looked this up as well, the wind covers the surface of the water, goes across the surface of the water in such a way that it makes it look like there's something obstacle like underneath it. Uh, and then finally, I love this 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 last stage when um, this wonderful image of Twain becoming overconfident uh, and sticking the toothpick between his teeth um, and thinking he's got everything sorted and everything fine. And what he realizes is actually he's learned a way of going down the river. And actually now uh, he's introduced this idea that we have to read the river. So although there is a shape that you have to know in the river, sometimes you can play around with that. And so he learns about cutoffs and he learns about, uh, you know, there's more than one way to work out if the river is rising or falling and driftwood is one way of doing it. But another way of doing it is looking at the water in the chutes and it's looking at the banks and seeing what the banks tell you. So he's now adding complexity to that way of understanding how the river works. So that reading the river is about bringing in that full independence, that ability to make qualified judgment to decisions, to predict what might happen in the future with, with more certainty uh, and with more basis, and to generate your own knowledge about best approaches. Um, and this, for me, again, is important in education because it's about developing that independence we want students to have so that they don't leave school just being able to recall knowledge, but they're able to think about and generate and predict, predict and generate their own types of knowledge. And they will do that in quite small ways initially, but we have to get them to that point. Um, it's more than once I've had that conversation with uh, colleagues about how is it we get students into A-level who've never once really thought about how history is created, how, how evidence and sources and evidence relate to particular questions we're, we're exploring. And the answer is we don't give them opportunities often in school to do those kinds of things. And that I'm sure is true with other subjects as well. How does Bixby do this? Well, he's constantly questioning Twain. Why do you think it's that? Why do you think it's this way? Why do you think the river is falling? 
um, when in fact it's rising, challenging his misconceptions, challenging his preconceptions about what's going on and moving him on. And I think what's lovely about this, and I mentioned this earlier, is when we get to the end of this whole process and Twain has learned all these things and he's developed these dispositions of thinking about reading the river and he's got his independence from Bixby. And I love that idea that this becoming a riverboat pilot was just such a massive formative part of his life. In fact, the name Mark Twain even comes from a riverboating term, um, which kind of is about um, how you judge distance and depth at a particular point. Um, and so he's kind of taken that name and the, the process of becoming a pilot has become part of him. And I think really good education, and this isn't gonna happen to students for every subject they study, but a really good education means that students go away with at least one subject, hopefully more, where they really taken it into them and it's become part of who they are um, and they've loved it and they and, it, and and it's formed them and actually we do that forming um through giving them independence and allowing them to think for themselves but it starts it starts by giving them the knowledge that enables them and empowers them to be an independent so if we go back to that question can knowledge uh, in the way that Ofsted's talking about, students must have knowledge. Can that be an, a positive thing? Is it always a negative thing? No, it's not always negative. Yes, it can be positive. We can empower and give students independence through the knowledge we give, but we can't just fill them like a bucket, um, <laughs> like one of the uh, um, EBAC buckets. We can't just fill them with knowledge and hope it will happen. There's so much more that curriculum entails, and that's what we're going to go on to in the next little section of this. Anyway, I hope that's been illustrative. I, I, I've taken that example partly because I love it, but partly also because it ties really nicely with the way Christine Council um, has talked about curriculum. And she uses this analogy of curriculum being a journey. And I like that uh, largely as well, because it tallies really nicely with that Mark Twain journeying to become a riverboat pilot and literally making journeys up and down that river. Um, curriculum is a journey. So Council argues that uh, it's a journey because we've got to think about curriculum as the whole thing, the whole journey. It's knowledge and experiences, crucially, not just knowledge, but experiences built up over time. Now, you're all spared at this point because normally what I might do is take uh, an American West crossing into into unknown and uncharted uncharted territories and do it that way. I haven't. Um, I'm doing it through this. Uh, but knowledge and experience are built up over time. The journey is a continuous whole. You can't just judge a curriculum by the tiny final little bit of it, this final sprint to the end. It's got to be everything. And you can't just skip all the way to the end. You have to do the whole journey if you want to get to the end of it. So this idea that everything is important if we're thinking about curriculum, the things that you did right at the beginning are just as important as the things that you do right at the end, maybe because you made mistakes in them, but also because they take you to the next stage that you need to get to. And therefore, and this third point, it kind of feeds from that, there is a relationship between all the elements of the journey. Each new bit makes the next bit possible. And sometimes it makes the immediate next bit possible, but sometimes it makes the things further down the line possible. Uh, you know, when I am going to go there because I'm just going to do this. But when emigrants uh, going to the American West set out in the 1840s from the eastern states, you know, from, say, Mississippi or Missouri, um, and they set off, they would have loaded up with a whole range of supplies. And those supplies, some of them were immediately important to them. When they took water, it was immediately important to them. Some of them, like salted meat, for example, was kept because it would enable them to do something much, much later on, which is survive in areas where there was little access to food. Um, and the same is true in curriculum. Sometimes the things that we, so the groundwork that we lay very early is important later. It's why when I have conversations with people about how do we increase, improve GCSE outcomes, my answer is always begin at key stage three. There are tricks you can do to improve GCSE outcomes in a kind of short time span, but they are often only ever tricks. And the best thing that you can actually do is lay the groundwork from the beginning. And of course, in key stage two as well. Um, Fourthly in here, this idea I love, the, the idea that the experiences cause us to think differently about the things we encounter later. So it's not just knowledge that we um, are, are provided with, but the experience of doing something changes the way we then later encounter similar things or different things that have, have echoes of earlier things. So again, if we think about the Twain example there, his experiences uh, of navigating dangers on the river dictated that when he came across this 
seeming reef, he reacted in a, in a very particular way and he stopped the engines and he went rode back on the engines and brought everything to a halt. But his then his experience of learning about that and learning about the idea of the wind reef changes the way he then does things later in the journey. It causes us to encounter things differently as we go further on. And those experiences are often overlooked when we talk about curriculum. It's not just about what you know, but the way you encounter it. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit as well. And then we, we touched on this as well, that a journey, a, any good journey, um, gives us greater independence. Right, so this brings us to a point of saying, well, okay, so knowledge can be powerful, um, but it still doesn't get around two things. One, what is the connection between knowledge and this idea of the disciplinary curriculum that I keep going on about? Uh, and that is interlinked with this big question of, well, how do you decide which knowledge still? Because you know the, the progressive argument remains, any knowledge selection is still an exercise in power. So we're gonna have a look at how uh, the disciplinary curriculum tries to grapple with that uh, issue directly. So uh, the, I'm going to make a slight distinction here, which Young and Lambert make, but also Young in other work makes as well, uh, which is that there is such a thing as knowledge which has power and powerful knowledge. And I've used that with a capital P and a capital K, although Young doesn't, just because I think it's it's becoming uh, a very driving idea. So in the Ofsted uh, framework is actually perverted slightly to become the most useful knowledge, which I think they mean powerful knowledge, but not quite what this is. Anyway, um, so part of any good curriculum construction is choosing the knowledge with the most cumulative power over time and thinking about, OK, if we provide students with that knowledge over time, it allows them to do other things. And it go back to that journey analogy that Christine Council talks about of enabling and empowering and creating independence. And if we think carefully about our educational aims, we should be able to marry those things up. However, Jung argues that some knowledge is more powerful than others and it becomes powerful knowledge. I, they are ideas and bits of knowledge that are so crucial that they underpin other thinking. And his argument is that this powerful knowledge doesn't just exist, isn't a sort of a social knowledge in the way that the traditional curriculum might have argued, but it's mediated and rooted in the discipline from which a school subject stems. So the discipline of history tells us a bit where well, this is not a great example, actually, but the discipline of history might tell us what should uh, what powerful knowledge should be in the school subject of history. The discipline of chemistry or the discipline of physics might tell us what should be in the school curriculum for science or indeed chemistry or physics. Um, and it's important, he said, because it is the discipline that establishes the processes by which that knowledge is generated. So rather than just people in power selecting a load of knowledge and saying this is the important knowledge, um, the he says the power to select that knowledge comes from the processes, the truth processes that a discipline has. So there is a method in science, or there are methods, but there is a broadly accepted scientific method which involves uh, making predictions, looking at data, drawing conclusions from data, and then opening, crucially, our data and our conclusions up to scrutiny. So the whole point, as my brother, who is a scientist and never tires of telling me, is that science is all about setting up hypotheses for testing and hopefully theories which other people will then knock down because that's the way in which you, you make progress. So Young's argument is we shouldn't be selecting at a political level what knowledge is important. We should be allowing the wider disciplines to be saying what's important because that knowledge is um, generated through a whole set of processes that are embedded in a community, a disciplinary set of practices so that they can be scrutinized by that discipline and therefore judged by that discipline. Now, that, in a sense, is about sidestepping this issue of power um, because we, we put that power into the hands of disciplines as the best repositories of that knowledge. Now, that in itself is quite controversial, but let's just leave that to one side for a minute. OK, uh, on this note, I think it's worth a little segue. And for once, a little segue into Bernstein um, is probably probably going to be helpful because we've used this phrase discipline and disciplinary and subject. And often I hear those used interchangeably. Um, I just want to define very briefly what I think might be helpful in thinking about these two terms. So if we talk about the discipline, Bernstein talks about the intellectual production of knowledge. So usually he's talking about what's happening in universities, but it could be other things as well. Um, so the intellectual production of knowledge is happening in the discipline. So there are a group of physicists 
at the moment who are working on the key questions at the forefront of physics, our understanding of physics, uh, and they are involved in producing new knowledge about the discipline. Uh, and eventually the discipline will ratify that knowledge and say this is core, important, powerful knowledge. Um, and there is the subject, which is about the educational reproduction of knowledge. So we're not creating new knowledge at a subject level. What we're doing is drawing on the disciplinary understanding that already exists uh, and is being developed all the time. Now, there's some really interesting things here because um, teachers, therefore, if we want to talk about this, need to be aware of not just the subject they teach, but the wider discipline into which that subject is connected. Now, there are problems here because not all subjects connect neatly to a discipline. History connects quite neatly to a discipline. There is a subject of history and there's a discipline of history in, in uh, the wider uh, society, uh, but other subjects not so neatly. So, for example, if you took PE, it doesn't neatly necessarily connect to a discipline of PE. It connects to things like professional sport, for example, um, and uh, science, actually lots of science issues. So, um, we need to kind of know that and teachers need to be aware of the processes by which a discipline operates. So how does a discipline decide about what is powerful as knowledge and how does it make those claims? And this brings up a whole range of other issues because it says, so if we have a look at the cloud on the right, which is my illustration of the discipline is this kind of big amorphous thing that exists um, and is a community of practitioners really talking to each other both now and over time and through hundreds of years, obviously, in many cases. Um, and what does the discipline involve? Well, it has uh, a range of thoughts around how we establish truth, whether that's scientific truth or whether how we investigate things in history or how we make claims in geography or whatever else. Um, it will have a range of key issues and debates that are currently uh, being debated and being uh, argued over and those truth processes being brought into play over those. And of course, there'll be lots of other things happening, but there will be some core things that are driving the discipline, I think. Um, there will be a range of things that are considered to be powerful knowledge in the discipline, and that could be powerful knowledge about how the discipline works. How do we enact a truth process? Well, there could be powerful knowledge, uh, particular ideas. So in science, for example, the idea that everything is made of particles is a pretty powerful idea that's got broad agreement in the discipline. It struggles a little bit more, this concept of powerful knowledge, in a subject like history. I don't think there's anything I could define uh, as you know substantively like that science example in history. I'm not sure there's anything that all historians would agree on. So we couldn't say, for example, that it's powerful knowledge that the Norman invasion fundamentally changed everything about Britain. I don't think you'd get everybody to agree on that. Um, but there are kind of powerful ideas that maybe the discipline holds as important. Um, and it has a whole range of sort of niche specialised knowledge as well. So the teacher uh, in thinking about their subject needs to know that partly the authority for that subject comes from this wider discipline. And therefore, the teacher needs to be aware of the knowledge which is held to be powerful in that discipline. Um, so they need to be aware of that. And they need to be aware of not just that knowledge, but the processes by which that knowledge was arrived at. So again, the science example often works quite nicely for this because you can see a direct connection. So if we take the science example because it works very nicely. You can see on the left hand side, all these things are what uh, might be described by Young, for example, as powerful knowledge. And the ASE has worked to kind of create these uh, for teachers so that it's helping teachers translate the wider discipline or disciplines right, in science into uh, subject specific powerful knowledge so that objects can affect one another at a distance that the composition of the earth and its atmosphere the processes occurring within them shape the earth's surface and its climate these are the big powerful ideas of science and underneath those uh, there are some sub uh, powerful ideas that actually are broadly agreed on by the scientific community. Um, and that that's, makes it powerful because it's got that broad agreement. And that's where we're kind of sidestepping these truth claims. Now, that works really nicely with science because it's quite a hierarchical subject. So it's working towards answers to particular questions. And, you know, sometimes new things will come up that will complicate things, but we're always trying to find rules and ways to make things work. It doesn't work so well in history because, again, coming up that list of, of, of powerful ideas or powerful knowledge, uh, a subject like history tends to diversify over time. So rather than finding one narrative, what we find is lots more narratives and it goes divergently 
So if we take, for, you know, recent examples in history might be the book Black Tudors by Miranda Kaufman has taken what we what we had as maybe a traditional narrative of the Tudors and has complicated it. And that process of continual complication is part of how history works. So it's not easy to get a list of powerful knowledge in history. However, and we'll come across this in science, there's also this idea of truth processes. So there's also a list here of ideas about science. So this is disciplinary knowledge, as we talked about in uh, one of the previous sessions uh, or earlier in this session, in fact. Um, and this says this is how scientists work and it's how scientists make claims. And so students need to know that this knowledge on the left is provisional because it's based on these ways of working on the right. So the knowledge that is our powerful knowledge now might not be our powerful knowledge in a year's time, in 10 years time, in 50 years time, in 100 years time. Um, because these processes continue, these ideas about science, these disciplinary ideas about science, and they may change that powerful knowledge. Now for history, this does work a little bit better because we can say there are a whole range of ways in which historians work and ask questions and use evidence and make claims that change the kinds of powerful knowledge we have access to, even if we can't definitively define that powerful knowledge quite as easily as we might do in science or maths, for example. So a disciplinary curriculum, therefore, uh, is one which draws from the discipline to help it select the knowledge to include. Uh, and by the knowledge here, I mean both the actual powerful knowledge and the knowledge about the discipline and the way the discipline functions and the way we claim truth in the discipline. And it helps students understand how knowledge is created. And it helps students understand that the um, knowledge is both uh, complex in its nature and entirely provisional. We are not giving students truth, we're giving them the best truths we have at this point as mediated by discipline. Okay. Teachers play a vital role therefore in that because teachers sit between the discipline and the pupils. We've touched on this briefly already. We've touched on the idea of journey. So teachers are effectively planning a journey at a subject level, which is, makes reference to the wider discipline. Okay, so Teachers therefore need to be aware of the disciplinary terrain and desirable destinations. They need to be aware of how the discipline functions. They need to be aware of what's going on in the discipline. And they need to know what kinds of things children need to be able to do that would allow them to mimic or um, uh, at least uh, go towards the, uh, the way the discipline functions more broadly, the kinds of knowledge the discipline uh, entails. Um, we therefore as teachers also need to know what are the key stopping points for pupils along that journey. Uh, and sometimes the way we do that is by referring to guides. We're talking about immigrants going to the American West, they very seldom went without a guide. And we have subject communities whose sole role really is to negotiate these relationships. So if you look at the historical association, lots of what they produce is about negotiating the relationship between what's happening in the wider discipline of history and what historians are writing and what uh, sh could and might be happening and should maybe be happening at a subject level to enable students to work in those ways. So something like the use of inquiry questions is a good example of that because it mimics the ways in which the discipline functions. Historians ask questions and build arguments uh, and therefore in schools the argument is we should ask questions and build arguments as well. Uh, and of course the teachers therefore have to map out the best routes for their students. So the idea is a curriculum that's disciplinary is helping students to appreciate all these key aspects of knowledge, but also the way the discipline works and in a way that's going to make sense in a logical journey over time in all those ways we talked about before. Uh, and the aim is to preserve the essence of the discipline, i.e. the experiences of that journey shouldn't trample all over the discipline that we are building from. If we reduced all science to learning facts about science and never did experimentation, that would not stop on the key stopping points on the way of the journey of science in, as a subject. It wouldn't touch on that at all. Um, if we never got students to predict in science, we just told them what the answers were, that would be similar. Uh, and therefore, anything which tries to uh, either miss out key points in that journey or shortcut that journey. You know, another way of doing a journey like uh, my Oregon Trail journey here would be to get a boat and just go around the, the Cape and just get there in luxury. Um, kind of misses out the whole point and the, the shaping aspects of that journey would not happen. Um, or, you know, in the modern era, you could just hop on a jet, couldn't you, and be there uh, within the space of a few hours. But of course, that misses out something really, really vital, which is the journey shapes people's understanding as they go through. So as, a, as subject teachers, we are kind of mapping this journey across and saying, what do students need to encounter 
on their way on this journey through curriculum, which will enable them to understand the wider discipline this subject connects to at a level that's appropriate for them. Because uh, clearly they're not going to engage with all the niche knowledge, the specialised knowledge I talked about before um, on the way. They're probably going to touch on tiny bits of that on the way, but they do need to understand how the discipline functions and how it makes claims about truth and how those truth claims are um, negotiated through time. OK, so we need to be able to enable students to access it. And therefore, pedagogy, the methods of teaching are all about thinking about how we enable that. Real pedagogy is about thinking about how we enable students to act, to understand the way the discipline functions in the classroom through the subject. For me, anyway, that's my uh, view on it. So this brings us to a question. If we're talking about the knowledge that students need, what kinds of knowledge are important? And again, there's a nice taxonomy that Christine Council uses here, which I'm going to just uh, outline very briefly. Um, we might need substantive knowledge. We definitely need substantive knowledge. We are going, students are going to need to be furnished with the substantive knowledge of their subject. And that's basically the stuff. OK, so in the Twain example, that would be the names of the points on the river or, you know, the types of reef uh, or possibly the ways uh, sorry possibly the uh, particular names of bends on the river uh, or the shapes of those uh, it might be a math the parameters of a triangle the nature of an ox oxbow lake in geography the concept of a peasant in history uh, the date on which the battle of hastings happened etc 14th of october 1066 unless you're in the julian calendar uh, disciplinary knowledge um, so this is the rules by which the discipline are, operates or how truth is sought. And I'm using discipline in kind of a broad way here because I'm aware that not everything stems from a discipline um, in the kind of uh, very formal sense. We'll come back to that idea in a minute. Um, so for Twain, again, this is the ways in which other the guild of riverboat pilots operate. Uh, and that might include, for example, knowing how to read a river and that process of how we read rivers or the importance of reading rivers or the fact we do read rivers um, is a way of creating truth about the river journey you're going on. Uh, it might be disciplinary in history in terms of argument. So knowing that the way that historians put forward and develop uh, new ideas and new thought in history is through argument and whatever we do in history we're always arguing about something not necessarily in that kind of heated debate but we're putting forward a case for something and supporting it and other people are engaging with that and either rebutting it or supporting it argument is a fundamental part of history and knowing that's important and there are different types of argument we can have in history we can have arguments about the significance of something we can have arguments about why things happened we can have arguments and knowing the shape of those arguments is a disciplinary thing uh, equally we might talk about experimentation as a way to establish truths in science and in other subjects as well and again, it doesn't work perfectly for every subject, but it's a helpful way of thinking about it, I think. Lots of things in maths, for example, might be entirely substantive. You know, uh, how we do multiplication, how we do division, how we do algebraic division is all kind of substantive concepts. Okay, then we've got other types of knowledge. So there's two types here. Again, I'm using some council's terms. We've got core knowledge, which is that knowledge which needs to be retained in the long term. So it's the vital things that you require to do the journey, uh, which might be, again, in the Twain case, the shape of the river or the names of particular points. Um, in history, it might be the key events which led to the birth of Weimar Germany in 1919. Why did that happen? And all the things that led up to that, some of the key characters like Abert, some of the key um, people, the Kaiser. Um, it might be grammatical structures in English. Um, all the things you actually need to remember to have said that you've done this. Now, quite often when we do, when we talk about GCSE curriculum, we get fixated on the core because that's the stuff they're going to be examined on or could be examined on. And therefore, we must make sure that it's, it's all embedded. Um, what often gets overlooked is this idea of the hinterland. And the hinterland, if you think about that in a geographical way, the hinterland is kind of the area around a place. Yeah. So if you think about a city, you have a city and the hinterland is the area around it. Uh, in, in Italian city states terms, it was the area around the Cotardo which um, fed the city. So it's the fields and the rivers and everything around it that allowed the city to survive. And the hinterland in knowledge is a similar thing. So it's the stuff that isn't absolutely strictly necessary. You're not going to necessarily be asked a question on it. And you're not necessarily um, going to uh, be examined. But it's those experiences of the journey. It's those things that help us retain the core. Now, that could be other knowledge. It could be hinterland knowledge. 
So it could be a whole range of knowledge that's not strictly examined but helps us understand something. Or it could be the way we experience the core knowledge here. So it's not just about input recall. For me in history, if we take the key events of the birth of Weimar Germany on the left as the core knowledge, there's two things of Hinterland that I'm, two aspects of Hinterland that I might talk about. Number one, I think it would probably be good for students to have uh, an understanding of the specific knowledge around uh, the Kaiser Germany prior to 80, uh, from from 1870 through to um, 1919. And actually, that's very often not on a GCSE examination specification because it's not strictly what's going to be examined. But if you don't know it and you don't know about it, it's very difficult to understand why Weimar is such a shift. Um, but equally, it could be those more experiential things like um, telling that through the stories about the Kaiser, which again aren't going to be examined, but will help students retain this idea of the problems in the, the Kaiser's regime and why Weimar was considered a, a viable alternative. So, for instance, this idea that uh, the Kaiser was often likened to a balloon, that if you let go of his string, he might float off somewhere, um, I think tells you a lot about um, autocratic power. Uh, or the fact that he used to enjoy getting his generals to dress up and perform plays for him. Uh, so there's, there's this little stories that kind of illustrate the nature of autocratic rule and then inherently some of the problems and why people might have found that a bit uh, problematic and why they might have wanted a change. Uh, equally, we could talk about the kinds of things which enable students to feel they are doing real history. So it might be actually engaging with uh, primary source materials or contemporary, I should say contemporary source materials, um, which explore the birth of Weimar and how people reacted to it. Now, those won't necessarily be in the exam, but they might add that interest, that um, fascination, which keeps them uh, loving the subject. And so it's about those kinds of things as well. Um, and if we go over, over to English, uh, we could talk about the grammatical structures of English. We could talk about, you know, the key characters or key themes of a novel. And for me, the hinterland in that is reading the novel and not just the spark notes, as was the trend and certainly has been the trend I've, I've seen um, in, in some schools. So that idea that it's not enough just to know the key themes. You, you want to immerse yourself in the way the story is told to and the way the author uses language. And that's a very different way of approaching it. That's hinterland knowledge that makes the core meaningful and helps you retain it in a way that just learning the stuff won't as effectively. And I think it's really important to say that curriculum decisions still need wrestling with. So even if you say there's a load of powerful knowledge in science, uh, we've just seen those list of things in science, it doesn't actually tell you anything about the order those should be taught in. It doesn't tell you about um, which of those ideas need revisiting, when they should be revisited. Um, there is still a whole range of wrestling that needs to be done when you're mapping out that journey. So that if you've ever spent time mapping out a route um, with friends particularly, um, and often there's lots of debate about which ways you should go, which is going to be the best route. Do you take this route because you're going to get a nice view at the top? Do you take this route because it's a little bit easier? The weather doesn't look that good for Wednesday. So which route? All those things still need to be thought about. So powerful knowledge is a lovely idea in some ways. And I like the fact that Michael Young has tried to say, let's liberate knowledge from the powerful and, and put that into the hands of communities of practice which have shaped this. But it doesn't actually solve the issue for us. We just we still have to come back to, a, uh, although we can link into those wider discussions, we still have to come back and make decisions at a school level about what's appropriate, what should be included. It's not everything the discipline tells us. And certainly like history, like I've said before, you can't just include everything because there's so much of it. It's just divergent and more and more complex all the time. Uh, so what should be included? We'll have to come back to what's our aims in education. Uh, what's my context and what do the children I'm teaching need? How can I connect them best to this curriculum? What should be left out is almost a more important question because time is a limiting factor. You cannot cover everything. Um, how do we stop it from being boring? Because actually if students don't engage with uh, the curriculum, it's kind of pointless. There is a whole motivational aspect here, which finally, finally, um, the proponents of cognitive load theory are starting to engage with and suggesting that maybe just rote learning stuff and recalling stuff isn't the only way to learn something. In fact, Daniel Willingham um, wrote a lovely piece about the fact that just memorising facts is about the worst way to learn something. So how do we stop it from being boring? How do we get students to care about it? That's not going to be answered by looking at powerful knowledge. Um, you still have to think about that in, in terms of your uh, subject. Um, how can we be sensitive to subject level issues? And this, uh, I think, is important. So not disciplinary issues, but how can we say what is acceptable simplification at a subject level because we're not just trying to replicate 
the discipline. We are mapping our way through it in a way that's appropriate to students. Uh, if we're thinking about a route, we're not just marching them up Mont Blanc, uh, for example. We are trying to do something that will give them access to it and enable them maybe to do that in the future, but not necessarily right away. So how can we be sensitive to those issues? Uh, and equally, in our pedagogy, how can we be sensitive? So that we're not doing things that trample over the, the discipline in our subject. So it might be uh, when we are thinking about writing in history, I know lots of people like to do a diary extract of a medieval peasant type things, but actually that's quite problematic because a historians generally aren't in the business of imagining what peasants thought, although John Hatcher maybe is an exception to this. So there is a little bit of um, um, bits around this. Historians are about using the sources and the evidence to, to build the best case. Um, uh, equally, peasants wouldn't have written diaries. So there is a kind of problem about using that. Uh, is it an appropriate way of communicating something? Now, that's not the most heinous example, but it's just an illustration of we have to be sensitive to how we get these things across as well. Pedagogy does matter. It's not the first concern, but it does matter once you've thought about what you're trying to achieve in terms of the discipline. Uh, team strengths, I'm not going to talk about an awful lot here. Curriculum renewal. Now, the big issue, I think, with a disciplinary curriculum, and this for schools especially, is that the discipline is constantly changing, it's constantly renewing itself, it's constantly questioning its assumptions, and therefore we as teachers need to stay up to date. How do we keep our curriculum in a state of renewal without it being complete overload? Uh, and there is a real risk here that, and I've seen this on Twitter over the last few weeks, people going, I don't know how everybody keeps up with all the changes in history. How does everybody incorporate, you know, Oris Ogus, Black and British, Black Tudors and, uh, you know, the five into their curriculum? I struggle to read a couple of books in a year. And that's a very real concern. So this idea that curriculum renewal is something ongoing and slow burn and something that has to be the best we can do in the parameters that we have. Uh, how do I teach ideas about how the discipline works? So if I want students to understand how historians use evidence to make claims or, or that uh, historians have to think carefully about the provenance of uh, the sources they engage with, how can I do that? There's loads written in uh, things like teaching history that you can get through the school's history project that will help you engage with those things. Um, because the traditional approach that I did when I started teaching, which was a unit where we just spent our three weeks going, what is history? Historians ask questions. Uh, this is a primary and secondary source. Uh, this is how you are critical with evidence generically. None of that really works. Uh, and actually it's, it can embed deeper problems, but there are ways to do it through your teaching. So lots of questions for you to ponder. I hope those are useful in setting some direction. So this reaches the end of my kind of broad curriculum primers. Next session, if you want to stick with me, uh, I'm going to be looking at some particular issues to do with designing the history curriculum, which may have relevance again to other subjects, but obviously is designed uh, much more for history teachers. Um, but I do hope you can join me and I hope this series has been helpful as well.